it is okay, it's legitimate. It's legitimate for the state to restrict or eliminate choice with the purpose of increasing a person's freedom. Now, I, I want you to think, I want you to think, please, um, and maybe you can tell me some other policies um, in which choice is restricted or eliminated for the purpose of increasing a person's freedom. Because there are other policies, but we don't, we don't think of them so often. We don't think of them so often, but they are important if we want to understand better this idea of freedom in the positive sense. Okay? If we want to understand freedom in the positive sense. Um, so, so can you give me can you give me some other examples in which in which individual choice is restricted or eliminated, and a person's freedom um, over time will will increase? For example, prohibition of drugs. Yes, that's an excellent example. It's an excellent example. So. Um, it's an excellent example. Of course, there's, there's a little bit of controversy about this, okay? But I think, I think in most countries in the Western world, really in most countries in the whole world, um, people accept that there are some, um, some drugs that are so dangerous that people should not have the freedom to buy them or use them, okay? So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an elimination of choice Again, with the purpose of, of promoting freedom. Uh, other examples. Other examples. Maybe exercising the freedom of religion. There's a number of religion where you're born as a limit. Um, Basically, you don't have a choice because you were born in such and such family which belongs to that religion. And then uh, so, some, sometimes, okay, I think I see your point. Sometimes um, people will say this. People will say, um, I have, I have freedom because I was born into this religion and this religion um, it uh, makes many of the choices for me. Okay? So, so I don't have as many choices as a person who does not belong to uh, my religion uh, because, because the religion provides a lot of structure to my life. Yes. So th this is the example. If you meet somebody, so I use the example I used before. Uh, if you meet somebody who is Jewish, who lives very closely according to traditional Jewish law, the life really, the life really, there's not so much freedom of choice. There is some freedom of choice, but the life really is obedience to the law, obedience to the Jewish law, okay? So if you meet somebody who is, who is Jewish and who is religious, uh, in, many, in many areas of life, they are not thinking about making choices. Right? They're, they're not thinking about making choices. They, they just say, no, I do this because, because the Jewish religion um, uh, tells me and all other Jewish people we should do this. And so, so it's a good example. It's a very good broad example. Um, and, and some people, they even think that, this, that this, uh, this promotes freedom, that this promotes freedom. I once saw a television program about very orthodox, very extremely religious Jewish people in the New York area. And there was a woman, and she said this, and first when I heard it, I thought this is very strange. She said, she said um, well, I am so happy I don't have to make choices in 90% of my life. You know, my life is very simple because uh, I, do, I do what the Jewish religion tells me to do. And she said, I am happy. You know, I am married, I have a family, and uh, I did not have so much choice. Uh, in many things, when I was when I was a little girl, I do not have so much choice now. Um, uh, many aspects of my home, for example, they they are they are governed by Jewish law. Um, and she says, "I'm happy." You know? It's like going to one brand supermarket. Yes, yeah, good example. Yes, and so so some people say with this example, some people say, "Well, maybe a life of many choices." is not the only kind of attractive life. If you meet somebody who is very religious, Jewish or Christian, um, Muslim, right? The whole life maybe um, has structure to it and there are very few choices, very few choices. And some people might say, well, that's a good life for me. That's a good life for me. But when you think of, of modern freedom, probably the first thing that comes to mind is choice. When you think of modern freedom, you think, 
Freedom is about having choices. It's about exercising choice. But maybe a few more examples. So Sergei gave us the example of, of drugs. So we do not have choice with respect to using certain dangerous drugs. To use such drugs is against the law. We cannot make them. We cannot sell them. We cannot use them. We cannot buy them. Um, we don't have choice there, but we would say, I think most of us would say, uh, this increases our freedom as we, as, we, as we live. Other examples. Can you think of other examples? So several come to mind when we think of children. So first is education. Children do not have a choice with respect to education. There are several related to education. What else? So if you like, if you like the novels of, um, of Charles Dickens, for example, maybe you understand what I am suggesting. Not to work. Not to work, yes. Children, children in most countries, they do not have the freedom to begin working until they're about 15 or 16. Now maybe if a children lives here in the countryside or in the farm in the United States, maybe the children informally will be working, but according to the law, and especially if a, if a, if, if a young person is living in the city, person cannot begin working until 15 or 16. That law, that law is related to the law um, about education. Because in, in, in England in the 19th century, you had many children working in factories 10, 12 hours a day, and of course they could not receive an education if they were in the factory. So the first thing that the that, that British Parliament did in the 19th century first is they passed laws against children working in factories and at the end of the 19th century they made education a requirement. So first they had to get them out of the factories um, and then then they had uh, compulsory education later in the century. Uh, similar, similar law about children uh, going to war. Children cannot be soldiers. Um, they must be, I think in most countries, 18. They must be at least 18 years old. Now, now, again, same thing. Ch a, a young person might say, maybe there's somebody who, who is 13 or 14 who says, well, I want to be a soldier. I want to be a soldier. But the view is, the view is, well, you are not mature enough. You have not developed enough to make this decision. Of course, if you are 18 or you are 20 or 22, then um, most people believe, okay, so then you can decide. Then you are mature enough to decide. But before that, before that time, you are not mature enough. Okay, and then finally, finally relating to relating to um, to sex and sexual behavior. So, so a young person. Um, so the phrase we have in English is age of consent. Age of consent. Um, a young person cannot have sexual relations until he or she. Uh, reaches the age of consent. So it can be 15, 16, I think, I think in many countries in the West now it's 15 or 16. And what does that mean? Well, you know, imagine, imagine in some state in the United States the age of consent is 16. 16. And imagine there, maybe there's a man who is in his 20s and uh, he wants to have sexual relations with, with a girl who is 15. Well, that's against the law and it's a criminal it's a criminal act if, if he does, um, um, if he violates, if he violates the, the law against age of consent. Okay? So all of those are easy to understand. And with children today, it's not so controversial. Most people would say, most people would say, well, with children, you take away some of their choices now, some of the big choices now, and in the future, they will have more freedom. They will have more freedom. And maybe uh, some of you, you know this, this famous story by the um, the Italian writer uh, Collodi. Um, do you know the story by Collodi Pinocchio? Okay, so they made. I think they make a Walt Disney Company. They made a, a famous movie about this, right? So what what happens in Pinocchio? What happens? It's like a good illustration of what, everything that I'm saying. What happens in Pinocchio? What's the relation between Pinocchio and sexual relations? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember reading anything about Pinocchio's <laughs> sexual. No, it's it's Pinocchio. Pinocchio, he's he's a he's wood, he's a puppet, right? He's made out of wood, and he wants to be a real boy. He wants to be a real boy, and to become a real boy, he must he must um, uh, show that he he's like a real human being, 
He must show, and he must show that he he is um, um, he is in control of all of his passions. He's in control of his passions and emotions. So what happens to him? Well, uh, he wants to be a real boy, and he has prom he has promised. Well, you will be a real boy if you if you act like a real boy. You act like a real boy, but he is still he is still made of wood, and he is supposed to go to school. He's supposed to go to school, and one day he is going to school, and a bad boy, uh, whose name is is Lampwick, Lampwick, Lampwick says, "You should not go to school today. You should go to go with me to the Island of Toys. You should go with me to the Island of Toys." And in the movie, in the movie, um, Pinocchio and Lampwick they go to something that's called Pleasure Island, Pleasure Island, and they go to Pleasure Island, and um, and they smoke cigars, and they drink beer. And um, they go on like uh, amusement park rides. No, Naruska Matraxioni, yes? Okay. So, so they do this, and, and so what happens to Pinocchio? Does anybody remember? What's that? His, something happens to his body. He yeah, yeah. He, or something. He, tu he turns into a donkey. He turns into a donkey. Like, and and you, you, probably you understand this. So, do you, do you know the. In, in Western Europe and United States, you know why this is important. He turns into a donkey because you know what we call the donkey? Something. No, we call it as an animal. You know donkey. Kaknaruskam. Okay. Okay. So we also call the donkey in English an ass, right? An ass is also a very stupid person. Right? It's a strong word. If you call somebody an ass, then the person is very stupid. Okay? So Pinocchio turns into an ass and he starts to make the noise that a that a, that a donkey or an ass makes. And, and this is important because the donkey sometimes in English is called beast of burden. Beast of burden. So it's like, it's like the animal that does all this very, very hard work. It's a stupid animal, but it does very, very hard work. So Pinocchio and Lampwick, they don't go to school. They're on Pleasure Island and they're smoking cigars and they turn into donkeys. And so what, what is the message? Well, the message is, of course, if you do not receive education, if you not receive education, you will, be, you will be a beast of burden. You will be just like a slave. You will just be like a slave. Because a donkey, really, it's, it's almost like a slave. Right? No independence as an animal, and it, does, um, um, you know, it just does very, very hard work. So that, that is what Kolodai wanted to say about this. Okay? So, so the... It's a good example. Kolodai wrote this in the middle of the 19th century. He wrote this in the middle of the 19th century um, at the time when European governments were saying, yes, all children should receive education. All children. And you think about this. You think about the idea of freedom, and you think about a person who is uneducated, completely uneducated. And really, that person, that person depends completely on other people. Right? You imagine a person who cannot read, a person who does not know anything about numbers. The person depends completely on other people. And so that is, that is a state, that is a state of, of being unfree. Even if that person has many choices, even if that person has many choices, I think most people would say the person is so dependent on others that really it's, it's, it's a condition of being unfree. Okay? So this is... This is maybe the best way to explain the idea of freedom in the positive sense. So it, it's rather easy to understand the idea when you think of children. It's a little more complicated when you think about adults, um, but we have a few examples for adults. So we have, we have uh, the laws against using certain drugs. Uh, we have other laws. So this is an interesting philosophical question. Uh, should, should a person have the freedom, should an adult have the freedom to sell himself into slavery? Well, the answer in the West now, and I think really in the whole world, is no. No, you, you should not have the freedom to sell yourself into slavery because in the end, of course, this means you lose your freedom completely. So you cannot, you cannot do this anymore. Even, even if you wanted to, even if you wanted um, to sell yourself into freedom, you, 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 or to sell yourself into slavery, you, you, you say, if you give me uh, $100,000, I will be your slave. And I will take this $100,000, maybe I give it to my children. Okay? 
You cannot do it because there is now an idea of, of human dignity that says that this is extremely bad and that no person, no person should be a slave. So you cannot do this. You cannot sell yourself into slavery even if you want to sell yourself into slavery. So we eliminate choice to promote freedom. To promote freedom. Um, a few other examples, different examples. Some are, some are serious, some are maybe not so serious. But, you know, in the United States now, I think every state, every one of the 50 states has a law that if you are driving a car, you must do what? Seatbelt. Yes, you must wear a seatbelt. Okay? Now, why do we have this law? To prevent security. from being some pressure. For security? And security. security in which in which sense? So why do we have this? It's an interesting law. Impossible accident. If if yes, if you are in an accident. So they, they do they did many studies, they did many different kinds of research, and really there's no doubt anymore. If you are in an accident, in a car accident, and you are wearing your seatbelt, uh, you are about fifty times more likely to survive the accident if you are wearing the seatbelt, okay? I mean, it's, there's no doubt anymore. If you wear the seatbelt and you are in the car, um, the chances are much greater you will live and avoid serious injury if you wear the seatbelt, okay? And so when seatbelts, when this first became a law in some states, many people were strongly against it. Many people said, no, I don't like being restricted in this way. It's a little uncomfortable. And many people, I remember, um, some friends of mine when we were in school when we started to drive my friend said well I think it's it's not such a good idea because maybe there will be a fire maybe there will be a fire and I have the seatbelt on and maybe maybe I, I cannot get out um, but they studied this many many times and they say in general um, your freedom will be promoted if we eliminate this choice so we take away the choice because we think Every rational person wants to live, and every rational person, if he or she is in a car accident, wants to uh, reduce the possibility of serious injury. So the law is, you do not have a choice anymore. You must wear the seatbelt. And if you have children in the car with you, the children must wear the seatbelt also. Okay? Um, so those are some examples. You see the relationship between all of the examples I have given you. Um, and I will refer to these, I will refer to these examples a few more times in, in my other lectures. But now, now I want to move on to the, the second lecture. So why don't I give you the, uh, the outline for the second lecture? So if you want to um, pass this around. Um, One more over there. Okay. So, um, I, I want to talk more about, about Constant and, and this idea of modern freedom. And here is where I start talking more about, more I talk, I, I talk more about, about history. Because, because again, the, 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 theme, the theme of these lectures is, is rights rights in history. And I want to begin by making a, a, a simple point. Um, at, least, at least I think it's a simple point. Constant gives his famous lecture in 1819. He gives his famous lecture in 1819 and uh, he, he describes this new idea of freedom. He describes this new idea of freedom. But one thing that he did not do in the lecture uh, one thing that is missing from the lecture is 
he does not discuss he does not discuss the development of this idea of modern freedom. For example, he does not directly ask the question, well, well, where did this idea of modern freedom come from? He said that the idea did not exist in the ancient world. So it seems the obvious question is, well, where, where did it come from? Where did it come from? And in Europe, in the 19th century, after Constant gives his, his lecture, um, many political philosophers uh, wanted to answer that question. Well, where did the idea come from? It, it's true at the beginning of the 19th century that more and more people are understanding freedom in this modern sense. And it's something of a mystery. It's like a riddle. Well, where did we get this idea of freedom? Where did it, where did it come from? And in my opinion, maybe the most philosophically rich answer to the question uh, was from Hegel, uh, the great German philosopher. Maybe the most interesting answer to this question comes from Hegel's uh, famous book, uh, we, tr we say in English, Philosophy of Right. Uh, I think in German it's Rex philosophy. Okay? So somebody mentioned the master-slave dialectic before. Um, the master-slave dialectic, um, I think it's a good thing. He, Hegel does not discuss this so much in philosophy of right. Uh, philosophy of right came after um, Hegel's famous book, uh, Phenomenology of Spirit. Phenomenology of Spirit was the book where he introduces master-slave dialectic. Philosophy of right was published after Phenomenology of Spirit. and um, he talks about uh, slavery in the ancient world in philosophy of right, but he does not give uh, the theory of the master-slave dialectic. Okay? But the reason why philosophy of right is important to me for these lectures is that Hegel is trying to answer this question, where does the modern idea of freedom come from? Where, where do we find it? How did it develop? Um, maybe you know this word in English, um, genesis. Genesis. So it's like, where is the, where is the source, the beginning, the begin? Where is the beginning of this, of this modern idea of freedom? Okay. And then how? And how did it develop? What is its genesis? And what was its, what was its development? Okay. Um, and. I, I, I do not think it's an exaggeration to say that the questions that Hegel was trying to answer in Philosophy of Right, I do not think it's an exaggeration to say that the questions he tried to answer, um, people, were still, um, people were still responding to Hegel uh, about 100 years later. Um, Hegel had a surprisingly big influence in Great Britain at the end of the 19th century. He had a big influence in Great Britain at the end of the 19th century, and it continued in Great Britain until the First World War. And uh, after the First World War, I think it's not so strange, um, British philosophers, uh, they suddenly lost interest in uh, many German things, many German ideas, okay? Because they think uh, Germany was the aggressor in the First World War, and uh, philosophically, Philosophically, many British philosophers said there is some connection between German politics and German philosophy in the 19th century. And so after the First World War in Britain, it seems no one is any, is any more interested in Hegel or German philosophy generally. They go, they go into a different direction, and after the First World War, uh, analytic philosophy develops. Uh, in Britain, okay. To, 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 this is a rather a rather simple explanation of what happened, but um, uh, from from the beginning of the 19th century when Hegel is writing until the beginning of the 20th century, Hegel has a great influence in Europe, including uh, Britain. And after World War One, uh, the influence in Britain uh, is eliminated; it just disappears. And then, of course. 
Of course, Hegel has a great influence on Karl Marx, a great influence on Karl Marx, and in my opinion, this was a, this was a bad influence. It was a bad influence. Uh, I, I do not think Marx understood Hegel um, um, extremely well, and um, there was a big difference between Marx and Hegel because Hegel did not try to predict the future. Marx tried to predict the future, and I think that this is not uh, philosophically um, uh, a good project to predict the future. In the philosophy of right, Hegel says that the purpose of philosophy is to describe the world as it exists today. He wants to describe the world as it exists at the beginning of the 19th century. Mainly the European world, but of course he wants to compare Europe with the rest of the world. So the difference between Hegel and Marx is Hegel wants to interpret the world as it exists when he is alive, but he does not want to predict the future. Hegel does not want to predict the future. Marx gives the world a prediction about the future. So that's, in my opinion, the biggest difference between Hegel and Marx. And um, uh, I think that Marx in trying to predict the future, he was doing something that philosophers should not do. Um, I do not think philosophers, I do not think anyone can predict the future, and this was uh, probably the biggest problem with Marx's uh, political and social philosophy. But Hegel does not do that. He wants to interpret the world as it exists. Uh, sometimes, as I was saying a minute ago, Sometimes people believe that there is a connection, a connection between Hegel's philosophy and German politics, especially the politics of fascism, especially the politics of fascism. And so, um, uh, in some uh, universities uh, in the West, um, scholars criticize Hegel even today, and they say Hegel he was he was a proto-fascist a proto-fascist, meaning that uh, in some, way, some ways he developed the ideas that uh, would be responsible for fascism in Europe, especially German fascism, a little bit Italian fascism. Now, in my opinion, in my opinion this, is not, this is not a fair criticism of Hegel. It's not a fair criticism of Hegel. Um, I do not think it's a good criticism. The only thing I can say about this criticism is if you look at Hegel's theory of international relations, if you look at his theory, not his theory of the state, but his theory of international relations, when he is writing about international relations, uh, some of what he writes um, seems very cruel. Very cruel. Because what he wants to say is, in international relations, in international politics, there is no law. There is no law. The only law you have in international relations is the law of the strongest state. The strongest state will do what it wants and uh, it might dominate, it might dominate other, th other states. The strongest state will have the greatest influence. And when he writes about this, it seems that he does not imagine the possibility that law could be introduced into international relations. He does not, for example, he does not imagine the possibility of something like the United Nations. Now, the United Nations, is, of course, is not a perfect organization. It has problems in theory, it is supposed to work very well. In practice, it does not work so well. But one could say, you know, the United States, the United Nations, United Nations as an organization, it has had some pos positive influence in the world since it was created. And it seems to me Hegel, he does not imagine even the possibility that there could be law in international relations. Um, and when he talks about the strongest states dominating other states, it makes me a little nervous. 
it makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but again, I do not think when he describes when he describes the modern European state, the European state as it exists at the beginning of the 19th century, I do not think he has fascist views or proto-fascist views or quasi-fascist views. I, I think that this is, this is a misunderstanding of Hegel's theory of the state, okay? Now, the big question, the big question that Hegel tries to answer is, where does this idea of modern freedom originate? Where does it come from? What is its genesis? And what is its development? And his answer is, his answer is, the idea comes mainly, mainly from the Christian religion. It comes mainly from Christianity. And when I say Christianity, I want to be a little more specific. Um, it mainly comes from, from, according to Hegel, Protestant Christianity. He believes that Protestant Christianity promotes freedom better than does the Christianity of the Roman Catholic Church. And it's difficult for me to say this in Ukraine. And uh, the freedom of uh, the, the ideas of the Orthodox Christian Church, okay? So he has a he has a he has a a preference for Protestant Christianity. I mean, now you have to understand he 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 is a philosopher. He also studied as a theologian. He studied as a theologian. Um, he was planning to become a theologian when he was a young man. He was not planning to become a philosopher. He was planning to become a theologian, and then uh, at some point he changed his mind and became a, a professor of philosophy instead of a professor of theology. So his, his theological studies had a great influence on his philosophy. And he was a Lutheran, and he believed that Protestant Christianity promoted freedom better than Catholic Christianity or Orthodox Christianity. Now, if you say this today, um, in the West, if you say today in the United States that, that the reason that the West uh, has such free societies, the reason that the West generally has free societies, if you said the reason, the source of the freedom of the West is the Christian religion. If you say this today in the West, many people will think you're crazy. They, 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 they simply will not uh, understand what you are talking about. And if you try to explain your idea, uh, they will think you are uh, crazy or stupid, or maybe you're just making a joke. Maybe you're just making a joke. But Hegel is very serious about this. He is very serious about this. And it is easy, I think, today if somebody is interested in this question about modern freedom, it is easy today to say, well, I cannot, I cannot accept Hegel's views seriously. This, seems, this just seems very strange. Hegel is a Protestant, and he says, the Protestant religion is the religion of freedom. You know, Protestant Christianity is the religion of freedom. Sometimes, sometimes he says simply, he says simply, Christianity is the religion of freedom. But usually he says Protestant Christianity. Okay? Sometimes he says Christianity is the religion of freedom, but usually he says Christianity, meaning Protestant Christianity, is the religion of freedom. So for Hegel, of course, the Reformation, the Reformation did many things to promote freedom. It did many things to promote freedom. So you could say that the idea of modern freedom, it developed a little bit before the Reformation. It was developing before the Reformation in the Catholic Church and in the Orthodox Church, but it accelerated. It developed more quickly because of the Reformation. Okay. 
Now, I want to explain just a little bit what Hegel means when he says that Christianity is the religion of freedom. I just want to make a few comments on the Christian religion and why Hegel believed that Christianity is the religion of freedom. So if you look at the outline um, for the second lecture, if you look at part C under number two, part C under number two, Hegel's reference to Christianity and especially Protestant Christianity as a religion of freedom. How could he say this? Well, he did, he did several things. At the beginning of the 19th century, he looks at the world. He looks at all the countries of the world, and he said in a way that I think is easy to understand. He said, well, the freest countries in the world at that time were countries that were both Christian and Protestant. The freest countries in the world at that time were both Christian and Protestant. So he had in mind Germany, Prussia, Scandinavia, Great Britain, the United States. Okay? And then he tried to explain why Christianity, not just not only Protestant Christianity, but, but all of Christianity, why the Christian religion was the source of freedom. So what did he say? Well, he said, if you look at the New Testament, if you look at the New Testament, it introduces ideas that become the basis for a modern liberal society. It becomes the basis, Christian ideas become the basis for this new idea of freedom. And maybe the best example of this, the best example of this is taken from um, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 10, uh, which is called uh, the parable, in English is called the parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So it's a little story that Jesus tells about uh, how people are supposed to live. And the question is, the question uh, one of Jesus' followers asked Jesus, um, you say we should love our neighbors. You say, Jesus, you tell us we should love our neighbors. Well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells a story uh, about this man who is a Samaritan. Does, does anybody know the story? Can anybody tell the story quickly? So what's the story? Everybody knows. Every, everybody knows it, yes? You know, in, in the United States, maybe this surprises you. In the United States and Britain today, many people, they don't know anything even educated people, they don't know anything about the Christian religion. They don't know anything about the... So, so the, the, the worldview now in the United States is very secular, and in Europe also. It's very secular, and so, for example, when I was in graduate school, I was friends with a, with a, with a, a man from... O he had his degree from Oxford University. He had his degree from Oxford University, and he knew nothing about the Christian religion because he grew up in a secular, a secular home, and when he was at Oxford, there was no, in his political philosophy courses, there was no discussion about uh, the influence of Christianity on political philosophy. So everybody knows here, everybody knows the parable of the Good Samaritan. So, so Jesus' answer is, your neighbor, your neighbor is anybody, anybody who needs your help, even if that person is a stranger to you. So uh, when Jesus was living, the Samaritans and the Jews, the relations were not very good. And when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, it's a Jewish man, it's a Jewish man who is, who is robbed. He is robbed, and the robbers, they hurt him. Almost he dies. And the Samaritan sees him. First two other Jewish men see him. So he is, he is on the road, and um, obviously, obviously he is hurt. Obviously he has been attacked. And two Jewish uh, people see him first, and they do not help him. And then the Samaritan sees him, and the Samaritan, even though he does not have, um, as a member of the group, even though his group does not have good relations with the Jewish people, the Samaritan helps him. The Samaritan, he brings him to a hotel, and he tells the man, um, uh, take care of him. I am going in this direction, but I will come back. And uh, if, um, if you need more money, when I come back, I will give you the rest of the money. But, but take care of him. And, and make him make him healthy again, okay? And so Jesus' answer to this question is, 
Um, your neighbor is anybody who might need your help, even if that person is a stranger to you. Maybe even there is, um, um, say, hostility between your group and that other person's group. So like maybe there's hostility or animosity. And so that's Jesus' answer to the question, who, who is my neighbor? And I think when Hegel says that Christianity is the religion of freedom, that Christianity is the religion of modern freedom, I think that this parable of the Good Samaritan, um, and I think, I think in one place Hegel says this, Hegel says in one place, if you want to understand, if you want to understand the politics of the modern world, you must understand the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because when you think about modern freedom, you think about modern freedom in, in rights in the modern world, what, what is happening? Well, um, when people respect the rights of other people, they are saying, I will respect your rights even if, even if you're your interests are not my interests. Even if, if your religion is different from mine, even if your philosophy is different from mine, even if your, your hobbies are different from mine, maybe everything you do in your private life, maybe, in my opinion, is wrong. Okay? Maybe you, you, you belong to a religion, maybe I think it's, it's a bad religion. Maybe you read some books that I think are stupid books. Uh, maybe you have other hobbies that I think are stupid hobbies, okay? But this new idea of freedom says, I must accept it. I must accept it. So I, I accept your freedom, you accept my freedom, even if I think you are using your freedom badly, okay? So you, you um, in my opinion, um, uh, you could be using your freedom uh, better. But... I still respect your rights. I still respect your rights. Maybe I consider you even my enemy. But I can live with you. Right? I can live with you. We can live, we can live together. We can live together. And Hegel says that really this idea of living together even with one enemy is because Jesus says many times, Jesus says many times in the Gospels, you must love your enemy. I mean, he says it. He says it in the famous, the famous, uh, we call it Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. He says, "You must love your enemies. You must love your enemies." And so, what some people say is that is that the modern politics of liberalism, the politics of modern freedom, it's a secular, it's a secular understanding of loving your enemies. Right? You have your rights, I have my rights. I do not respect your way of life. I think it's a bad way of life. But I will respect your way of life from the standpoint of the law. Right? In that sense, I, because I respect your rights, maybe I am loving you as an enemy. Do you understand this? Do you understand? So, so the theory of modern freedom, according to Hegel, it comes from ideas in Christianity such, such as this, okay? Now, I want you to understand something. <clears throat> I told you, um, <clears throat> even many educated people in the United States today, if you said directly, well, Christianity is a religion of freedom, they, they would think you were crazy. They, th they would think you were crazy, maybe you were reactionary, maybe you were just playing a joke, okay? But um, some scholars, some scholars say that um, Christianity as a religion um, in its history was not a very tolerant religion. So um, I included, so I sent Sergei some, some short readings before, before, um, um, before you all came here. I sent him some short readings which I think he sent to you. So there's a scholar um, uh, and he wrote a book called, um, he wrote a book about religious freedom. Um, the scholar's name is Perez Zagorin. Zagorin. Perez Zagorin. And um, 
He wrote a book and he said Christianity as a religion, Christianity as a religion is actually of the great religions in the world, it's the least tolerant religion. It's the least tolerant religion. So he looks at, he looks at the history of persecution in the Christian church. So his answer is just the opposite of Hegel's. His answer is just the opposite of Hegel's. So I, I included a little bit from <clears throat> Zagorin's book because I want you to know that there are scholars, good scholars in the West today who, who, who would disagree completely with Hegel. So Zagorin um, he is an intellectual historian. He's not a philosopher, he's an intellectual historian. And um, the implication of this book on religious freedom that he wrote is obviously he would disagree. He would strongly disagree with, with Hegel. Okay? Now maybe you're asking, asking yourself, well, who is correct? Who is correct? Is it Hegel or is it Zagor? And my answer would be, um, the correct answer might depend. The correct answer might depend on how how wide your historical um, analysis is. If you take a very wide historical analysis, you could say Hegel is correct. Hegel Hegel saw the ideas in their genesis, in their beginning, and then he saw how they developed. And Hegel is is. Um, he is open about this. He is clear about this. He says these ideas, they took centuries to develop. They took centuries to develop. And at the beginning, it was very difficult to know how they would develop. How they would develop. And of course, some of the developments, some of the develop developments, no one could have predicted. No one could have predicted. But <clears throat> as a philosopher, he wants to he wants to analyze their development. And this is what Hegel means when he says, as I told you earlier, that the purpose of philosophy is to describe the world as it exists. When I first read Hegel when I was in graduate school, I said this is very strange, that you have a philosopher who is saying the purpose of philosophy is to describe the world as it exists. To describe the world as it exists today. Because when, when I before I read Hegel, when I, when I was thinking of philosophy, always I think, well, philosophy is always about the ideal world. But Hegel says, no, 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 philosophy is about this world. But to, to, to describe this world accurately, of course, of course you must also know the ideal world. And so what Hegel is doing is he's describing the world that exists through a description of the ideals of this world. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I pause there. Comments or questions on what, what I have said so far? Did yeah. you have a comment? No, no, no. Oh, yes. Uh, I would like to mention Schopenhauer's and then Nietzsche's uh, uh, word uh, that Hegel really were a stupid philosophy, foolish philosophy. Because, of course, uh, Christianity cannot be a religion uh, of freedom. Christianity were a religion for slaves. Maybe it were a way uh, from slave, slavery to freedom, but not a religious of freedom, according to Nietzsche or Schopenhauer. So I say, I say two things there. Okay, okay, good. No, continue, okay, continue, uh, continue. Hmm? And uh, I would like also to use uh, Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's method, not genetic method, but genealogical method, because uh, in contrary of genetic method, Genesis uh, uh, say about um, Genesis says about uh, past event, mm -hmm. but genealogy uh, not only past but present and future. That's why Nietzsche uh, could say that. Uh, who want to be free? Only slave. Uh, who uh, try to be uh, free? Who uh, who are weak? That's why he wrote about woman, Jewish, and slave. 
as a real agent for freedom. And he said that uh, uh, Nietzschean critics, genealogical mm -hmm. critics, uh, say that um, uh, uh, now uh, uh, there is only natural condition of freedom and natural condition of weakness. And if you really free man, uh, noble man, good man, it's okay. But if you slave man in your nature, you cannot change your nature. You can be maybe um, in appearance, you can be uh, free, uh, but uh, you cannot change your nature. That's why it's Nietzschean <laughs> diagnosis. Diagnosis, and uh, it seems to me that uh, the future development in German history shows that uh, Nietzsche were uh, more right than Hegel. Hegel were, it seems to me, utopist uh, or idealist, uh, not real uh, diagnosis. But uh, Nietzschean uh, critics shows that we cannot be. Uh, there are a lot of men who cannot be real free. Isar Baron also can say that, oh, of course, we can proclaim or claim that everyone is are free, but it is not real thing. Uh, only few men or maybe a minority of nations and peoples can be really free. Um, so do you want my do you want my response? Do you want my, my response? Okay. So so it's I, my, I, uh, I opinion. Yeah, sure, sure. So I um I know that Schopenhauer Schopenhauer thought Hegel was he, he was he was um I, I would not say stupid. Schopenhauer thought Hegel was a fraud. Do you know what I mean by this? A fraud. Like it's like a great deception. Abman. Like a huge deception. So he, he did not he did not Schopenhauer did not take Hegel seriously as a philosopher. Okay? Um, so I think Schopenhauer probably thought Hegel was um, stupid because he was a fraud. He was not a real philosopher. Okay, I disagree with that. I, I like Schopenhauer. I like Schopenhauer, but I, I just think he misunderstood. Okay. okay, yeah, okay? Yeah. Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Um, yes, he disagreed with Hegel about Christianity. Strongly disagreed with Hegel about Christianity. But Nietzsche also respected Hegel for Hegel's historical method. In what, in I think, genealogy of mor morals, Nietzsche says this is Hegel's great contribution to philosophy, the historical approach oh, to yes. certain philosophical yeah. questions. Okay. <clears throat> Everything else you said, I disagree with completely. Okay. Okay. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, <laughs> well, um, I said, I said, Hegel's philosophy of international relations makes me a little nervous. Okay. Now I will say this about Nietzsche. Almost everything in Nietzsche's philosophy makes me nervous. Almost everything. Mm -hmm. Almost, you know, this idea of, of um, some kind of master class of human beings. You know, people who are by nature free. Yes. And people who are by nature supposed to rule other people. Who by nature are meant to be slaves. This, this, this entire idea, uh, I oppose completely. Oh. I oppose it completely. And I think it's a very dangerous idea. And I want to explain why I think it's a dangerous idea. Um, and I tell you a little bit more about what, what I think Hegel was trying to, to do. So, it's the beginning of the 19th century. Hegel's writing about 1830. He is describing, he is describing Christianity as the religion of freedom. And he also knows he also knows that the influence of Christianity is weakening. Christianity is losing its influence on the, the world of Europe. Why is, it losing, why is it losing its influence on Europe? Well, because of the idea of modern freedom. The idea of modern freedom has become a new ideal. It's a new ideal that is in some ways against the Christian ideal. Why? So you think about the ideal of modern freedom and it says individual independence. Individual independence. This means 
maybe some people will not be Christian. Right? People will think about it and some people will say, some people will say, yes, I, I accept Christianity as a religion, so I will continue to be a Christian. Other people will, will, will think about it and say, no, I don't believe this religion. And the important thing is, Constant and Hegel know that now this is a free choice. This is a, a choice that is protected by law. They have the right. They have the right. If they, if, if they don't want to be Christian, it is their right. Now it is their right. So Hegel, he is describing Christianity as a religion of freedom, and he also knows that the influence of Christianity in the 19th century is, is less much less than before. And he worries about this. He, but he does not, so here's where Hegel differs from Marx. Hegel worries about it, but he does not, he does not recommend a complete solution. He does not recommend, he, he recommends some political solutions, but they are, they are like modest solutions. Okay? So they're just very modest. It's not like Marx where you get this this, this solution to every problem that's affecting uh, the working classes uh, in Europe and uh, the rest of the world. You know, Marx gives this, this enormous, comprehensive solution. Hegel's, Hegel's solutions are very, very modest. Okay? And Hegel, he recognizes the problem. The problem is Christianity has promoted freedom, but the influence of Christianity is going to be less. It's less today in the 19th century than it was before, and probably tomorrow it will be even less than it is in the 19th century. Right? At the end of the 19th century, the influence of Christianity will be less than, it was, than what it was at the beginning of the 19th century. Okay? Um, and, and when you talk about Nietzsche, I, I would say the following. I would say the following. It seems to me, hey, Hegel obviously, he could not have predicted Nietzsche, right? Hegel could not have predicted Nietzsche's philosophy. He could not have predicted that there would be a man, uh, you know, with the name of Nietzsche um, who would try to criticize Hegel's ideas about freedom, Christianity as the religion of freedom, and so forth. But Nietzsche, to me, this is my broad interpretation of Nietzsche, Nietzsche, to me, uh, he wants to... Um, eliminate, he wants to eliminate the influence of Christianity in politics and philosophy. Nietzsche wants to create or recreate a pagan philosophy. So who does Nietzsche admire? Well, he admires the Romans before Christianity. He admires the Romans because of their empire, because of their strength, because of their contempt for other people, right? What was Rome? Well, it was one conquest after another. Who else does Nietzsche admire? Well, he admires Machiavelli. He admires Machiavelli, um, who wrote uh, the Discorsi, which is Machiavelli's analysis of why Rome was so successful. So you look at what Nietzsche admires, and Nietzsche does not, he does not admire the Christian world. When, when Nietzsche says that Christianity is a religion of slaves, it's similar to what Machiavelli was saying. It's, it's stronger in Nietzsche than it is in Machiavelli. Machiavelli says that Christianity is a, is a religion which makes people think about the next world. So Christians, they do not think so much about this world. They, they're always thinking about heaven. When they are living in this world, Machiavelli says, Christians are always thinking about what they must do so they can go to heaven. So Machiavelli thought this was bad because he thought it makes Christians too accepting of injustice. Too accepting of injustice in this world. Right? Too accepting of injustice because each individual Christian is thinking about going to heaven. Okay? And so Machiavelli says, well, Christians... I don't think Machiavelli wants to say Christians are slaves, but he wants to say they are, it's a similar word, they're servile. So they are not necessarily slaves, but they, they are too 
too willing to serve, right? They're too ready to serve other people, okay? Nietzsche, like, Nietzsche agrees with Machiavelli, but Nietzsche's criticism of Christianity is much stronger. And so, so what do I want to say? Well, if you want to talk about how Christianity lost its influence in Europe, look at Germany, right? Look at Germany. Look, look at Germany and look at, look at the, the development of fascism in Germany. I say this because Germany, during the Hitler years, it was not really Christian. It was, it was anti-Christian. It was strongly against Christianity. It was, so how do you say this in Russian? Pagan. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was pagan. And it was, it was proud. Germany was proud of being pagan. Okay? During the Hitler years. Very, very proud of it. And so the war ends, and you have division between East Germany and West Germany, and what, what do many West German political leaders say? Well, they say it was very bad for Germany at the beginning of the 20th century that the, the influence of Christianity was completely lost, or almost completely lost. And so the most important political party in West Germany, before the reunification of Germany, the most important political party was called the Christian Democratic Party in West Germany, from about 1945 to 1989. This was, this was the strongest political party in West Germany, and German politicians say it was very bad for Germany to abandon completely its Christian ideals uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, questions. How are we doing for time? Is it time for lunch? Yeah, but, but time for lunch, yes. Okay, all right, I stop here, thanks. Please. <laughs> idea, if you had to if you had to summarize his historical, uh, his, his political philosophy, you would say, you would say, well, he showed, he showed, he wanted to show that rights are historical achievement, historical achievements, that that rights people have uh, in the modern world, they are they are really historical achievements. There, there is nothing inevitable about rights. There is nothing. Um, that uh, is, is obvious about rights. Now, some people say today, some people say today that you get rights from a theory of natural law. If you have the correct theory of natural law, you will see that uh, every person has, has some rights. And I am not against such theories. I am not against those theories, but uh, anybody who, who believes in natural rights uh, must admit that as a historical matter, as a historical matter, um, most people did not have rights until the modern period of, of, of history, uh, meaning uh, after the Middle Ages. Most people did not begin to have rights, meaningful rights, rights with, with real content and with real meaning until after the Middle Ages. And Hegel... Um, I think makes a very important point about rights as historical achievements. And because he considers them historical achievements, he does not, as we say in English, he does not take them for granted. He does not, as I said a minute ago, he does not believe that they are inevitable. Another way of putting this is, is a negative way. If they are historical achievements, uh, Certainly, certainly we can lose them. We can lose them. We can lose them, in fact, very easily. Because if somebody thinks about the history of Germany after Hegel wrote, after Hegel died, somebody thinks about the history of Germany, as I said earlier before lunch, no one could have predicted, no one could have predicted um, the emergence, the development of fascism in Germany. No one could have predicted that, but Hegel, in saying that rights are historical achievements, I think makes it easier, a little bit easier for us to understand um, the emergence of fascism. Because, as I was saying, one of Hegel's worries was that uh, Christianity uh, was losing its influence uh, in Europe. Christianity was losing its influence because of the idea of modern freedom. And 
he did not know exactly what could be done about the development that he was describing. But when I look at Nazism, when I look at fascism in Europe, and when I describe it as a, as a pagan philosophy or a pagan uh, political and social movement, I think there is very good evidence uh, because, because Germany in the 19th century was, um, of course, a, a country of, of great philosophic, uh, a very high level of philosophic achievement. I mean, I don't think, I don't think if, if one studies the history of philosophy in Europe, I don't think that anybody would dispute that the greatest achievements in philosophy in Europe in the 19th century were in Germany. I mean, Germany did not have any serious rivals as like the, the, capital, the capital of European philosophy in the 19th century. And Germany represented, one could say, in Europe, it was like the height of culture, the height of European culture in the 19th century. So the question is an important one. So how does Germany go from being the center of philosophy in Europe and the height of European culture in the 19th century, how does Germany go from that point to the very low point that is represented by, by German fascism? It's, it's an important, I would say it's an urgent historical question, it's an urgent philosophic question. And I believe that Hegel gives us some of the resources to understand some of the sources of, of um, the, the end of the Christian influence and um, the, uh, the emergence of a, of a pagan philosophy and pagan political and social movement in Germany. And, you know, many people who study political philosophy in the West, I don't know if this is true in Russia and the former Soviet Union, but many people who study, the political philosophy, study political philosophy in the West, they are very interested in um, the emergence of fascism in Europe in the 20th century. Because uh, even if somebody knows political philosophy only a little bit, the emergence of fascism seems to be this very strange development. Um, so you have the French Revolution, and you have the 19th century. And in the 19th century, you have many uh, positive development. So, for example, you have things that I was talking about earlier. So, all children by the end of the 19th century must receive an education in Europe. Almost everybody today says that these are very good developments, right? So, children at the end of the 19th century, they're not working in factories anymore. Uh, they must receive a, a, a free education. Um, uh, at the end of the 19th century, almost everyone can vote in Europe. Almost everyone has the right to vote. Um, and by the end of the 19th century, it's obvious that, that um, the right to vote is not only for men, but it's also for women. Okay, so by the beginning of the 20th century in most European countries, women have the right to vote. People look at these developments in the 19th century and say these are all very positive developments. So people who study political philosophy, especially in a country like the United States where you know, we were not directly affected by fascism, by European fascism, so they're very interested in this. So how does fascism... How did fascism develop in Europe after all of these positive developments in the 19th century? And of, of course, it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated answer, um, but um, uh, it's an important question. It's an important question that I think anybody who studies political or legal philosophy uh, should be thinking about. And uh, there is a very great distance. What I'm saying, my final point, there's a very, very great distance between the mentality that Hegel wanted to describe at the beginning of the 19th century. Right? So when Hegel, says, when Hegel says that the purpose of philosophy is to describe the world as it is, one part of his, of his project, his philosophic project, is also to describe the, the mind, the mind as it exists when Hegel is writing. You know, what, what is the European mind at the beginning of the 19th century? What is it? Hegel, Hegel wants to describe this. He wants to describe this fully. What are its ideals? What, what moves, what animates its spirit? And of course we can do, though this is not pleasant to do, we can do the same thing with fascism. Right? We can try to describe the mind of European fascism of German fascism. Now, is this a good exercise? Yes, it's a good exercise. It's very, very unpleasant. 
It's very unpleasant, but it is a useful exercise because it makes us think of what Hegel was saying, which is rights are historical achievements. And if you want to understand a completely different mindset, which is so strongly against rights, against universal rights, then you should uh, read uh, history books as well as literary works about, about fascism. So I included in the readings that I sent Sergei before everyone arrived here, I included two very short stories by a, um, a Polish writer who was born in Ukraine. And I, I am curious to know if you ever heard of this writer before. Uh, he was a Polish writer who was born in 1922 and he committed suicide in 1951. Um, and his name was Tadeusz Borowski. Tadeusz Borowski. And um, at my college in New York City, I have had two students uh, from Poland, two very good students from Poland. And um, this is a little surprising. So neither one of these students, when I met them, they had, neither one of them uh, had heard of Borowski. Neither, and then they asked their parents, and their parents told them a little bit about Borowski. And so they're very surprised. They come, to, they come to the United States, they come to New York, and they have this American professor who introduces them to a Polish author. Um, and in fact, uh, in one of my courses, I, I even have my students read one of these short stories by Borowski. And th the best example, if you want to understand a little bit the mindset of German fascism, is this story called The Death of Schillinger. The Death of Schillinger, because you know, Schiller is a very good Nazi. Uh, he is working in one of the death camps in Poland, and um, uh, he has probably killed, with his own hands or his own gun, he has probably killed 10,000 people. And he is proud of this fact. And this story, death, The Death of Schillinger, describes how Schillinger himself was killed. And it also describes uh, his own reaction uh, to being shot. So, so one of... Um, one of the prisoners in the camp uh, shot him. And uh, he did not die immediately. And the story is very interesting because before he dies, um, he is revealing his thoughts. Uh, he's in great suffering because he has been shot, and he is revealing his thoughts. So I recommend the story to you because it tells you a lot about the, the mentality of, um, of, of this man who is like he's a representative of German fascism. Okay? So I, I stopped there. That's uh, all I wanted to say for the rest of my second lecture. Do you all have any comments to, uh, or discussion before I begin the third? We, maybe we just have a little bit of commentary or questions before I move on to the third lecture. Yes? Uh, maybe if you say that uh, the understanding of freedom comes from the really um, Christian religion and this tradition, and then we say that uh, uh, about secularization, is that means that we could say that the freedom uh, secularized in some sense from our life too? That, that the idea of freedom comes from the Christian religion, as you say. Yes. But now we say that we say that the Christian religion does not place so much in our life yes. like before. So it, it could be really understandable as freedom come out from our life too. Uh, yeah, so, so there are, two, there are two, at least two ways to think about this, right? This is very good, very good comment, okay? Because, because a general concern, a general concern of, of some people in the West, I mean, I think especially some intellectuals in the United States, is that, um, especially if, obviously if they're a Christian, if they're a Christian and they look at the world today, they say, well, the influence of Christianity is less than before, and maybe this means that our freedom will be less than before. Maybe this is very dangerous. And of course, of course, um, some some people, if they are educated, they will they will talk about an example like Germany. They will say, "Well, look at Germany. Look at Germany at the end of the 19th century. Look at Nietzsche's philosophy. It's a very anti-Christian philosophy." And then look at what happens in in the 20th century. So I tell you something that's interesting. Um, so in the United States, I I once met this man, and I respect him very much. He's he's a rabbi. He's Jewish, and he gave a lecture. He gave a lecture at Princeton University when I was in graduate school. Um, and it was a lecture about religion in the United States. Broad theme. But he surprised many people because he is Jewish and he said, he said, so I am a Jewish man and really um, I am not indifferent. I am not indifferent to my neighbor's uh, religion. He said, he said, I know Jews are a minority in the United States, but he said, he said, I prefer as a Jewish man 
I prefer that my neighbors be Christian instead of my neighbors having no religion. And so many Jewish students who went to the lecture, they were surprised by this. They said, what do you mean? This is, you know, because sometimes Christians are against the Jews, right? As this man, Perez Zagor, and he writes about this. Of course, in the history of Christianity, Christians have, have at different times, historically, uh, they persecuted the Jews, okay? So some students were very surprised by what this rabbi said. And do you know what his answer was? It was a very interesting answer. He said, he said, well, he said, of course I know Christians at different periods in history persecuted Jews, they were against Jews. He said, but there's a difference between Christianity as a religion and as maybe like a philosophy um, and um, a person who lives in the world without any philosophy. So he gave this example. He said, he said, if my neighbor is Christian and if my neighbor is doing something bad, I as a Jewish man can still appeal to his Christian ideals. I can say, you are doing something bad, but this is not um, consistent with Christianity. And I could, he said, so I am Jewish, but I know enough about Christianity that I could, I could quote passages from the Gospels and other parts of the New Testament and say, you are not living up to Christian ideals. And if I say that to him, probably he must think about what I'm saying. And maybe I can, maybe I can persuade him that he is not uh, living up to Christian ideals. But he said, suppose my neighbor, suppose my neighbor is a Nazi. Is there anything to which I can appeal? That is, you know, in the United States we have a very small number of Nazis. Like, you know, American Nazi Party. American Fascist Party. We have a very small number. So the rabbi says, is there anything to that person to which I can appeal that will make him think about his... And he, and he said, no. Right? Why? Because, well, fascists and Nazis, they're completely against certain groups, including Jews. They're against blacks, they're against Jews, completely against them. So there's nothing in, in that person's mentality uh, to which I can appeal. Do you see the point? Okay. So that's, that's one way of looking at it. One way of looking at it is saying, okay, if Christianity uh, has, is the source of much of the freedom of the West, uh, is it bad for the West today? that Christianity has less influence. But the other way of looking at it, and so I want to be fair, because this is a big, big debate in the West. The other way of looking at it is to say, well, um, now the West has uh, many people who are secular, who are secular, who also support freedom and individual rights and democracy very strongly. So now maybe Christianity is no longer necessary, maybe because of this new support from secular people, especially secular intellectuals, um, the influence of Christianity um, does not need to be as great as it used to be previously. That is, maybe it's not so important that Christian, Christianity's influence is less than it used to be. And if you want to understand how most, most secular intellectuals in Great Britain, in the United States, think of themselves, this, this is it, right? Most of them are secular. Most of them um, believe that you can support democracy and human rights without any uh, support from religion. And many of them, many of them are very suspicious about religion. They're just very suspicious. So these are the kind of people, if, if, if I said seriously to them, I agree with Hegel, Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity, it's, it's the foundation, it's the source of most of our freedom in the West. These people, they would laugh. They would say, you can't be serious. You can't be serious. But I, I broadly agree with Hegel. I broadly agree with Hegel. But um, these intellectuals in the United States and in Great Britain, they think that um, uh, you can support democracy and human rights uh, from, a purely, from a purely secular uh, position. So it's a very good point. Anything else? Okay, so I, I move on to the next lecture. Um, I give you, um, give you the outline for this.